Um, my talk is called How to Think More About Death. So you might think I've come to the wrong TEDx conference, maybe. <laughs> um, should get me down to TEDx aging. Um, I want to talk to you about a very specific type of death. Earlier this year, I worked for four months in a care home for the elderly. And I want to talk to you about death in a UK care institution. I want to talk about what our concept of a care home is, our involvement with the idea of end-of-life care, particularly for people who don't have anyone who gives a crap about them. I mean, people who are the most isolated. Um, so I would call care homes, when I was working in one, cheekily, the community no one chose to be in. It was a funny place. Um, when I was there, within the first week, something quite brilliant happened. I was sat in reception. Is this? Yeah, it's, it's going. It's a goer. I was sat in reception and I was doing some e-learning, which you have to do before you can get out on the floor, bit of health and safety. And the receptionist left. Uh, and I was on my own. And I could see the sort of first ward and a lady knocked on the door. I said, come in, come in. Can I help you? She had a coat on, she had a bag. Um, she looked pretty ready to go. She'd clearly been visiting a relative. She said, oh, can, you, can you help me get out? I was like, yeah, of course. I oh, know it's, it's, it's amazing here. <laughs> it's amazing. So I took her to the door, and, and they have these door codes. They have these door codes just in case any of the residents try and get out. I said, don't worry about it. I'll tell you the code. So three, seven, seven, you got that? One, yeah. Off you go. So off she went down the street, and uh, of course, within seconds, care staff were running out from within. <laughs> Is that Pauline? Sorry, is she a resident? Yeah. No, I did. Yeah, I did let her out. Um, <laughs> yeah. So if you could just, yeah, I guess you could chase her or something. <laughs> here's a fact. Here's a fact. Most of the people in the care home I was working at didn't have any visitors. I mean, no one, no relatives. Not a single person came to visit them ever. And maybe that's because they didn't have any surviving family, or maybe their family lived on the other side of the country, or maybe it's because they were just mean to everyone they knew and no one could be bothered to go and see them. Um, but I would contend that most of the care staff are kind and care and they're good people and we've heard a lot of scandals. I would contend that most of those people are doing a bloody good job with the resources that they have. But the thing is, is that what care staff don't really have in terms of resources is time. And they don't have time to listen. And I mean listen, not in the sense of hearing a request, but in the sense that you would listen to someone, a friend, a good friend, if you sat down to hear them talk about something troubling. Um, and terrifying things happen in care homes all of the time. One lady who I met in the home I was working at called Jill, was very good to me. She didn't have dementia, and she was very good at communicating, so she quickly became a friend. Uh, she had a, a phone, which was her lifeline to the world around, and she actually gave, gave her my number, which may have been a mistake, because I sort of ended up having about 10 calls at midnight <laughs> for a week. <laughs> um, but she was a good lady, and she always liked to go on trips. So when we did do trips outside of the home, she'd be the first one to come, and I'd go up and get her um, ready. She would always be ready. She would have her bag on her lap and her coat on, and she'd be ready to go down to the bus. So we organized a, a trip to the Tate one time, and I went up to get her, and I was quite excited about it. Um, and she wasn't ready, and I said, Jill, what's, what's wrong? And she said... I'm sorry, I don't think I can come. I've received terrible news. Oh, what is it? What is it? Can I do anything? I said, can I do anything to help? She said, no, um, it's my husband. He lives outside of the home. He has a carer. He's ill. And they've called and told me that they think that he might die today. And I said, that's terrible. Is there anything I can do? When are you going to see him? And she said, I can't go to him. He lives at the top of a 10-story building, and I'm in this chair, and he can't come down, and I can't go up. So I'm just going to be saying bye on the phone. 
And that was shocking. Obviously, that was shocking. And the thing is, no matter the good work that care staff are doing, no matter their work, they don't have the time to help with something like that. And realistically, if you're in a home, mostly, if you haven't got any relatives coming in, the only people you're going to be seeing are people who are underpaid, overstretched, and maybe even undertrained if you're unlucky. And that's kind of a harsh reality, regardless of the variance in whether their heart's in it. And that's why we have this stereotype of a care home death as kind of utterly depressing, because it, it's, it's powerless and, and it's limp in its loneliness. And what I want to say today is that we're not thinking enough about it. You're not thinking enough about it. We don't mind. We don't mind talking about death culturally. We'll talk about it a bit. Maybe even there's some appeal to a glamorous death, you know, of heroin in the veins, 27 club. Um, <laughs> or maybe not. Um, <laughs> but we don't like to talk about a more boring death, which is, you know, maybe you've been alone for four months watching repeats of Dragon's Den on tap, and you're thin and you're in a bed. And we don't talk about it because it's mundane. And because it's mundane, it's frightening. Because if something's mundane, where is the meaning? Where is the purpose? So I want to make three contentions today. Number one, I think it's already pretty obvious, and I think that these people uh, at end-of-life care who are most isolated could do with our attention, maybe, our company. I think that there is a great benefit, a great meaning in being seen and heard. Even if we can't take people outside of their situations, there is a great importance that someone can really see them, that someone can really hear them. My second contention is that there are some things we do really well in care, and there are some things we do quite badly, and that maybe those things say something, possibly, about our society on the whole. So you could say that a care home is sort of a microcosm for our core social values, and it's funny when you look at them, it's funny when you look at how they work. There are some things that we do well, and maybe those things like physical health, we take care of, we've got policy to ensure that everyone's going to a good home. We'll have a private space, mostly people are looked after. But there is a softer, more nebulous thing that we struggle with. And in care we might call this uh, social involvement and participation, or perhaps it's wrapped up as a quality of life. Um, this thing is hard to achieve, because when you look at what people are actually doing, maybe there's an activity coordinator, maybe you're going to do a few trips if you're mobile, but maybe you're just going to be watching a lot of TV. Uh, we've all heard about that, digital entertainment stepping into the void, and I want to say, you know, where is policy, where are healthcare targets listening to what I can only describe as the needs of the soul? And the third thing that I want to sort of contend is that there was a great benefit for us, maybe, maybe, in going into these environments. So a very unquantitative survey of my friends revealed something that uh, I already suspected to be true, which is that not many people want to go into care homes, really. <laughs> it's not that appealing. But there are a lot of people, I believe, on the whole, that do want to do good things. It's not that we have a dearth of them. It's just that, for some reason, not many are going into care. Uh, so I've come up with a few what I would call theories of avoidance. Sort of, why are we avoiding these environments? Um, and I thought about it, and I was like, well, they do fail. Care homes do fail some of my basic sort of tests, good time tests, you know, questions they ask if I'm trying to decide if I want to get up off my ass and go out that day. Um, you know, is it far away? Is it a nice joint? Are my friends going to be there? Is there something cool to do when I get there? Um, so on the first company, care homes don't do that well, ostensibly most of the people in them are either dying or losing their minds, and if that doesn't bother you, then when you actually get to chatting, maybe they've got dementia, as 80% of people in care homes do, and they're losing trail of their thoughts, so it's quite uh, conversationally, it's a tough gig. <laughs> uh, and then there's the environment. Um, the environ, uh, not traditionally appealing. As we all know, the mind might tick along, but the bowels often do not. <laughs> uh, 
And heaven forbid, well, our, our bodies start doing these spectacular ways of falling apart when we get older, and heaven forbid you combine um, sort of losing your mind and muscular control of the bowels at once. <laughs> That's a combination. <laughs> In my mind, these jokes are going down really well, but <laughs> I think I've made everyone a bit too somber. <laughs> So perhaps there's a sort of stagnance, perhaps there's an odeur, but I don't even think that that is the problem. I don't think that's why we're not all flooding into care homes. I think we probably deal with that. I think there's a third thing that might be key, and that is that you are dying. You are dying. So there's this huge rift in space-time between you and that person at the end of life. Space, because, you know, when do you see them? I mean, really the people who are, who are bed-bound, who are near the end, who are scraping the void. Unless you have a relative who has passed, and I sincerely hope that you have not seen too many relatives pass away. Unless this, then you are not physically confronted by death in our society very often. In fact, it's quite rare. And then time, because in the case of my generation, there's an entire lifetime between you and, and that moment, your whole lived life between you and your own death as an elderly person. But then you sort of, there's this great empathetic leap that you have to make to be able to imagine yourself in that situation. And yet, there isn't. There isn't. Because there's also a continuity. There's a kind of surreal reality to it. It's actually, whilst being hopefully very far away, it's actually simultaneously very close. And that's quite frightening. And that's why we get this thing that I, I've sort of termed uh, an exponential awakening, which is that basically most people who do volunteer in care homes are, are quite old themselves, as though, as though they woke up one day and they're older. Ooh! <laughs> I, th I think I'm going to die. <laughs> and it sort of accelerates as you get older, so I'll call it the exponential awakening. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, this is quite seriously, as you do actually reach a certain age, you do see people around you are dying, although I've heard, uh, and, and, and your friends and your family, and you think, well, blimey, there's this quite frightening experience just over the hill, and maybe I should get involved, and maybe I should do something about it. That's quite a sort of strange twitch of a... <laughs> knows it, so I did that. So maybe I should do something about it. But the thing is, is that whilst it is only the people who are temporally close to death who care, whilst it is only them, then the issue remains marginal. And so by the time that you do get around to caring, there is an inevitability that you won't be able to do much about it. So how can we draw this knowledge of death closer, especially for the younger of us? And what might that movement come to mean? So care homes are currently liminal. They exist in the edge of society. We don't think about them much. And death is an edge. Death is this kind of precipice. It's the most pronounced cliffhanger we have. Uh, but it's a precipice, but it's also a transition into something or into nothing. And uh, talking of edges, I want to borrow this kind of cultural idea, this kind of literary idea, if that's your sort of thing, you're going to like this bit, <laughs> um, that edges can be where the most magic really occurs. Edges are the place where the normal lines of reality are fated to transform and, and blur so that perhaps things look a little different. And then if you are looking for it, if you're in pursuit of it, there can be a kind of transformative magic to these places, where standing at the edge allows you to see the normal swathe of things in some kind of stark contrast, where it's somehow illuminated. And, and the word liminal comes from the root limin, which traditionally stands for threshold, and a threshold is the place at which things that were obscure and unclear become significant enough or voluminous enough to become manifest. And so I think that death might actually be an intensely vibrant and an intensely meaningful space. And, and people have talked about this, but I want to talk about it specifically in relation to perhaps the most frightening, the mundane death. 
I think if we can confront that space, and if we can really look at it, perhaps we can endow it with some meaning. And we can flesh out these seemingly barren experiences just by giving them attention, just by giving them careful thought, and by giving our compassionate attention to people who are entering these places isolated and completely alone. Perhaps we can transform them. And perhaps they can, can transform us. So, so care homes are liminal, but maybe, you know, they're on the edge. But maybe that's okay. Maybe they can stay there. They can stay on the margin. Maybe it takes us to journey out there to go on a walk, not a wonder or a little mental jolly, but a really good long hike down to the border of what is meaningful, down to the border of reality and life and death, and to sit at that threshold with people who are facing perhaps the most frightening things, and to look at the human experience there and its purpose and its meaning. So I want to say that Old people are losing out because they haven't got anyone to hang out with and they haven't got anyone to really hear and see them at this really climactic point in their journey. I mean, those isolated people. And then society is losing out because if we prioritize uh, physical well-being in our institutions over spiritual and relational well-being, then we basically consolidate end-of-life experience for a lot of people as a place where meaningful existence stagnates. And then thirdly, you are losing out because there is this incredibly powerful, incredibly important thing happening just down the road to a whole bunch of people, all of us really, one day, all of them, and you don't have party to it. You might not even be thinking about it. And maybe if you did have party to it, maybe it would be hard, but maybe it would change your life. And maybe it would change the way that you see life. And you know, whatever we take from that as individuals, it's different, you know, it's varied for all of us. But I guarantee it's transformative. So I think that we have the power to see care now now as a place for meaningful engagement. And it should be normal. It sh it's for all of us, that vision. And I think that it might actually be good for us. It might be essential. It might be transformative. Thank you.